We have spent two sessions on the prayer in Acts uh, 4, 23 to 30. And I thought at the beginning it would just be two sessions to stress those two things, that God is, God is sovereign, which we saw, and that we should pray, therefore, for boldness in speaking the Word of God. But what I want to do is go back and look at this Psalm 2 and see if we can find a clue in the psalm for why the early church treated it the way they did. Now, let me remind you, they began their prayer, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? And I said, that's the question. And then they answered it. And the answer was, the kings of the earth set themselves in this rage, in this plotting, and the rulers were gathered in this rage, in this plotting, against the Lord and against his anointed, because God predestined it. God planned it. They came against Jesus according to plan. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. This is the Lord's anointed Jesus, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles who were raging, and the peoples of Israel. This is all fulfillment of Psalm 2 to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So that's why it was happening. So he reached all the way back to God's sovereignty. He didn't, he didn't stop at any secondary causes or means. He went straight to the ultimate cause of why the Gentiles were raging and why the peoples were plotting and why they crucified Jesus. They did all the things they were gathered together in this city against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your plan predestined to take place. Now, why did the early church stop quoting Psalm 2 and claim this kind of action from God in the fulfillment of Jesus? So let's go back and read it. Now, I am not absolutely certain of what I'm about to show you. I commend it to you for your consideration. In these first nine verses of Psalm 2, 1 to 9, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? So that's the question that the early church asked and answered by saying, because God predestined it predestined the killing of his son. God planned it for our salvation. That's their answer. Now, in the psalm, how does it go? The kings of the earth, he, he continues to set up the question. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds. This is where the church stopped quoting. And I think they got their answer about the death of Jesus from this and its implications. So what did they see? These Peoples and nations were saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords. So let's kill Jesus, you, you might say. Let's burst their bonds and cast away their, their cords from us. Get rid of all this false teaching. And it says, this is God's response to that kind of raging and plotting. He who sits in the heavens laughs. This is all in vain. You are not going to succeed in overcoming God's purpose here. The Lord holds them in derision. All the soldiers and all of Herod and all of Pilate and the peoples that were crucifying him. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying... 
As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And I'm suggesting that what they saw, perhaps, was that when this was spoken in the psalm, they heard this, I have set this very sovereignty. I put my king up. You think you are raging and plotting and destroying my purposes and my son and my king? You're not. I'm acting. I'm setting my king on Zion. I am bringing him to Jerusalem, my holy hill. And you're making it a hill of desecration and ruin. And I'm treating it as the most holy place on the planet because my son is dying for sinners there. Then I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now that's quoted in Acts 13. We bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. So when the early church read, you are my son, today I have begotten you, they were, they were seeing that in the, in, the, in the death of Jesus and in his subsequent resurrection, a son had been established. He, it was like he had been brought into being at that moment as the sovereign of the universe, conquering death and establishing himself as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which leads now, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. So, in dying and rising, missions happens and the nations come to God. And then last stage, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel if this does not happen in their case. So here's, here's the main thing I want you to consider. You can see how difficult it is to be sure that this is the way the early church read this psalm. But this, it seems to me, rises to the level of high likelihood in view of what they made of it in Acts chapter 4. I have set my king on Zion. I, the one, my hand and my plan predestined all of this raging opposition that lifted my son up on the cross in Zion and crucified him. But I, in fact, was establishing him as king who through the resurrection would be established as my precious begotten son. 